a very important part of studying nucleic acids is knowing that their integrity and their accuracy could be compromised by processes called mutations. Essentially, the word mutation refers to any change in the DNA base sequence. So the problem with mutations and uh, usually the reason why it, it, it gives off a negative connotation is that it can lead to deranged or non-functional proteins, which of course means that a person having significant mutations could have some kind of disease. Some of them can even be fatal, okay? And uh, remember, even though we have ways to quote unquote proofread the central dogma, just like I have been saying about replication or our, our translation, the mutations are bound to happen. The, the mutations that kind of uh, 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 bypass uh, the uh, proofreading process are called spontaneous mutations. That is to say that even if our cells have their proofreading mechanisms and they are very, very stringent proofreading mechanisms, it doesn't mean that mistakes are, 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 are not happening. They still happen. There are still some mistakes that can um, come out despite the uh, uh, imminent stringency of our uh, central dogma enzymes. So those things are called spontaneous. And uh, spontaneous mutations are supposed to be resolvable. Okay? That means even though they happen in our body, our, our body has ways to deal with them and prevent them from becoming bigger problems. Now, of course, uh, there are some mutations that are said to be induced meaning um, they could be uh, not just because of our uh, natural uh, tendency to make mistakes despite the proofreading mechanisms, but this could be due to external factors, environmental factors. And uh, that means there are things around us called mutagens that could improve or not really improve, increase the number of mutations to the amount that our body may not actually be able to tolerate anymore. In that case, that means that for the spontaneous mutations, our body has repair mechanisms to fix these, which I cannot, uh, which I will not be able to discuss anymore in this slide. But for the induced ones, depending on how uh, how many mutations take place, they can either be fixed or they can be beyond repair. But here in the recording I have, I will just focus on the mutations themselves and probably um, mention a little bit about how they can be repaired in brief. First, do know that by effect, we could classify mutations as either silent, missense, or nonsense. A silent mutation is one wherein there is no amino acid change. That is, for example, UUU can be mutated to UUC. That is a mutation still, because remember, mutation means any change in the DNA base sequence. So the mere fact that I am changing the third letter from U to letter C means that something has changed. This counts as mutation. But remember, the genetic code is said to be degenerate, right? And what if my mutated codon is actually a codon that is degenerate to the first one, such that UUU and UUC just give us the same amino acid. It's a case wherein it's like something changed, but based on the product or the result, we didn't feel it. Or probably why we call it silent is in metaphor, we cannot hear it. Oh, did something happen? I don't see anything that's changed at all. That's why we call it silent. Next, if it's a missense, there's some kind of you know mistake already. It's like it's palpable. You can feel it because here finally we have a change in the amino acid. UUU becomes UUA. This is not anymore degenerate to UUU because UUA actually codes for a different amino acid. Um, if you go if you go to the uh, 64 codon table, this is actually equivalent to leucine. So here we already sense something going on. Like we think of phenylalanine as the supposed or the correct amino acid. Then the fact that we mutated the codon into something that gives us a different codon, we think of this as something that's already a mistake or wrong. That's why we call it missense. 
Now, there are even rare cases. I'm not really sure if it's that rare at all, but there are other cases that the mutation gives us a nonsense result, wherein a codon, which was initially, initially a coding one, becomes a stop codon or a non-coding one. So for example, from UGG, I just changed the third letter to A. So from something that codes an amino acid, I now get one of the three stop codons. Okay. Now, by the mechanism or by what really happened with the basis, okay, we can uh, classify mutations as point insertion or deletion mutations. Okay. And uh, do note that this is talking about things on a small scale basis, because if it were to be discussed large scale, this is kind of already within the realm of genetics, really. That's why I'm trying to avoid going too far to that. The large scale mutations are actually more of chromosomal already. So in, in that case, instead of writing words or just letters, you would actually discuss large scale mutations as something with drawings of chromosomes. But uh, maybe I'll reserve this for a future recording, advanced recording. But for the small scale mutations, we could just uh, make do with just sequences or letters first. Point mutations are small scale mutations wherein there's a substitution of one base. And by the word substitution, we remove one and in its place, put another letter. Okay. Just like in organic chemistry, substitution means, right, for, for example, I have AX, substitution of X with Y gives us AY. So from two letters, I get two letters still. And based on the nature of the change, it could be, the point mutation could be transition or transversion. In a transition point mutation, the chemical nature of the base is preserved. I mean, from purine, the change is to another purine, or from pyrimidine, it is to another pyrimidine. So for example, UUU to UUC, this is actually the silent translation I had a while ago. Since the change in letters, uh, letter is from U, uracil, which is a py pyrimidine, to C, which is also a pyrimidine, there's no change in the nature of the base. So of, of course, if this was like G to A, purine to purine, that also counts as the same idea. So things like those count as transition. But for transversion, there's already a shift in the nature of the base from purine to pyrimidine or pyrimidine to purine. For example, in the missense a while ago from UUU to UUA, from a pyrimidine, we now replace it with a purine. So that's a change in the chemical nature of the base. Okay, it's as, if, it's, it's as if I could actually call a mutation based on both the effect and mechanism. So for example, UUU to UUC, since I know it's silent, at the same time, it's a transition. I could call this, you know, if you want to be very nitpicky with this, you could call this a silent transition point mutation. Okay, or I could call UUU to UUA as a, a missense transversion. Okay, really depends on probably uh, what question you are asked by, by your teacher. Now, notice that since here, I'm not really changing the number of the letters, there is no change in the so-called reading frames. By reading frames, I am referring to the way that we read the codons. Remember when I taught the rules of the genetic code, I mentioned that the genetic code should be non-overlapping and commonless. That is, there should be no repetition of any base and I should not skip any base such that we read this as robotic as possible, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And in that case, there's always this kind of part wherein we separate one codon from another. In that case, we can think of this as like, you know, in, in music, I usually uh, use music for this because it's very, uh, sheet music like in nature, like one, two, three, and then that you can consider that as a measure in a three fourth, right? Um, a sheet. So one, two, three, and then that's one measure, and then that's the next measure, and then one, two, three, that's the next measure, then three more beats, the next measure. This is like a reading frame. So, like you could call the first codon as the first reading frame, and then this is the second reading frame, and then the third reading frame. And 
if I have a point mutation, the reading frames don't change. So for like example, I have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So like um, we have the first reading frame, second reading frame, third reading frame. If I, for example, replace the third codon here with any other codon, that doesn't change the fact that my first reading frame is still one, two, something. I replaced it with uh, X, whether it's transition or transversion, that doesn't change the fact that after this reading frame, I have still preserved the second and the third reading frames. Now, of course, I'm saying that because when we go to the other small scale mutations, the reading frames are not anymore preserved. For example, by insertion, it means that we are inserting an extra base. So for example, my original reading frames go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. If I add a certain X here, the reading frames after this will shift. For example, uh, although the original frame here has been preserved, starting from where the X is, all of the reading frames will be adjusted. For example, from the original one, two, three, we now get X, one, two instead. Of course, remember, if you are to follow the genetic code, you cannot place a comma over here. Remember, the genetic code is commaless. You have no choice but to read the thing that has been inserted. So from one, two, three, one, two, three, we now have one, two, three, X, one, two. And this number three, which a while ago was part of the second reading frame, will now be part of the third reading frame. And then this number three, a while ago, which is part of the third reading frame, has no choice but to become part of the fourth reading frame. So notice that all the reading frames starting from where we inserted this X has moved or shifted. The same goes with deletion, although this is kind of the opposite of insertion, which of course means you remove something. So let's say I have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and then I remove this one here. So from one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, I now get one, two, three, one, two, three. This one is gone, so two, three, one. So if this is first reading frame, second, third reading frame, and this one here is actually, you know, like an extra thing right here, it's not part of any reading frame. By deleting one of the bases, that extra one at the end now becomes a part of the third reading frame. In that case, we could still say that uh, this reading frame, I mean, this reading frame right here has moved because it changed from where we deleted this base. And since in both insertion or deletion, or sometimes even people combine insertion and deletion under the word indels. So since indels lead to reading frames that adjust or shift, we often call indels also as frame shift mutations. So point mutations preserve the reading frame, indels do not, okay? And that is significant because uh, probably in the future when I discuss specific repair mechanisms, the way that we deal with point mutations and the enzymes we use for these are not the same with the enzymes we use to deal with mutations as a result of indels.